those who don't know you, this is Mr. Joshua Alabi. He's a storyteller, a film and theatre director, and a creative strategist. Um, tell us a bit more about yourself. Tell us where you're from, how old you are, your background, basically, from primary to <laughs> where you are now, please, Mr. Alabi. Okay, um, you said it already. My name is Joshua Alavi. Um, I'm a mix of many things, but not the jack of all trades, master of none, master of many, um, and master of any, many interrelated things. I, I, in a nutshell, I, I like to say I'm a storyteller. Maybe the storytelling then ties everything together. I'm the artistic director of Kinesaw Concept Productions, based in Lagos. And um, so, about me, uh, sometimes it's a bit difficult to an to answer that question. Let, but let me I'm a lover let of me, stories. Let me push you in the right direction. You were born in, you were born in what state? What year? Um, you are born to Mr. and Mrs. Alabi. You have siblings. Let's go in that direction. I'm trying okay. to stir up your childhood now. Okay. <laughs> I was born um, on the 24th of November in 1989. And um, I... So I come from a family of eight. I'm the last child. And <laughs> last child that, God willing, grew to be like the first in terms of um, my doggedness and maybe stubbornness too, of wanting to be the best in everything I do. So um, I grew up in, I was born in Lagos from Oshun State, Nigeria, though. Uh, my parents are late now, both of them. My dad used to be a police officer. I grew up in the, in the barrack and the barrack um, influenced my, I think in a way, my kind of art. Um, a lot of things came together to influence that art. So I attended police children's school. I used to participate in all the somersaulting, jumping, flipping, gymnastics, and um, it was quite interesting for me. And from there, I went to um, police college secondary school. I don't know if it still exists now, anyway. So, and then the whole match pass thing, it wasn't just a, um, an entire sports day thing for us. It was regular. Um, we learned a lot from the police and from my dad as well. Um, and 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 childhood. I used to travel with my mom to the village. To she was really close to her dad. That's my granddad. And he was the. He was the like they call them. I mean, in different parts of the Yoruba. Uh, you, different parts of the Yoruba um, culture, they call them different things. They call, some call them, so it, it's basically like um, the, I don't say chief priest, but like the... Would you say diviner? Diviner, maybe diviner, may, maybe diviner, something like that. So, but his own kind of divination was mixed in a way because I remember he used to... Um, do a lot of things with both the Ogun worshippers, the Shongo worshippers. I think he was stronger with Shongo, uh, the Shongo worshippers, because um, his name, I can't remember his first name, but Shongo Dele, that's like the family name. And um, so the Olon Romila, all of them used to come together. And so I used to enjoy the music, the songs, and all of that. And my mom grew there in the village as well. So my mom then used to tell me stories. So I, I learned storytelling and got to learn a lot of stories through my mom. So my mom would um, tell us all the stories of how she grew, really strange stories, and not just stories told from people to people, stories that she made or she experienced, stories of some women, for example, in the town that they would say, nobody should talk to this woman, or she's been, um, what do they call that thing now? She's been, uh, hey, when they, when they like, um, uh, what's that thing now? Like to chase someone out of the village because she's ostracized or something. Um, yes, ostracized or something like that. You know, that's who she wants to talk to. And then she would always go to that woman's house. So there were a lot of people. There was one that used to be like the reporter 
worshiper of the river goddess. And so a lot of stories that she actually experienced, because I remember then my grandfather used to tell me about how stubborn I was and how I took it from my mother because um, it's whatever festival or sacrifice that he told my mom not to touch or you know whatever cloth or that she would always want to do. And that was um, inspiring for me and interesting. I loved the magic. They used to do a lot of magic then. Um, I remember there was one day my grandfather sat in front of his of his hut and then he told me to describe my he said he wanted to give me a chicken that should describe my how the one I would like. So I said, okay, I would maybe and he had a lot of them, many. He used to feed them every morning. So that morning I remember he said, um, so I, I think I mentioned okay, a black one with something. I, I described it in a way. And then he he said some things. And I don't know how it happened. Anyway, in like five, seven seconds, all the chicken from nowhere, I don't know how, all of them, you know, ran. And for me, I was a baby. I don't know if it was real magic or, you know, I was really, really small. So it felt like, you know, powering just to me. And so that was um, my upbringing. And I learned a lot of art from those festivals, from those... Um, rituals and um, music they made in the village. Brilliant. So, the young man goes to the village, visits granddad. Granddad imparts a lot of nice magic in him. Um, <laughs> he moves up to police college now. Um, did you finish at police college? No, I, I didn't stay there for long because I remember there was an issue that um, something happened, then I used to fight a lot. I used to be like, um, I used to fight. And um, not in the, I, I was always on my right. So I remember there was an issue. I didn't finish. Um, I had beaten someone up and my dad got all the trainings and all the, I injured him badly. And all those things they were doing to us was getting into my brain and turning me into something else. So it took me to one very local, primary school where we we're like 3,000 children in one big compound. Okay, so that's where you finished from and you did your WIAC or GCEs? Or... Um, I did my WIAC in, I mean that was primary school anyway um, and yeah. then I moved to Fanlot, Fanlot somewhere around the Blegba owned by my aunt so actually I did my common entrance in that school and okay. my secondary school was all through was at Fanlot. So it was owned by your auntie, you said. Tell us a bit about her, how she influenced your life. Um, let's know when, by the time you were getting to Farnlot, we've established now that you were stubborn. Not in a negative way, uh, but you were stubborn. So how did you, how were you able to now remold yourself to pass through Farnlot without any problems? Ah, I didn't pass through, pass through fan lot without any problem. Tell us some, tell us I some stories. Left. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, I'm just laughing because I, I'm, I've been having to go to fan lots like almost um, twice every month. Because, so, anyway, um, I got into fan lots, a different environment all the way from Ogba to Alagbado. So it felt like, you know, too far. Ogba then we used to feel like children of the rich. So, um, but I got into fan lot. I, I remember from GSS 1. Um, so GSS 1 to 3, they were meant to wear Nika, the shorts. And SS 1 to SS 3, they were meant to wear... Just <laughs> Lucia knows, knows what I'm about to say. So, I remember that time, um, there we were, I think, yes, I was in, I was in GS 1. So, somehow, they started giving the people in GSS3 trousers to wear. So GSS3 to SS3 would wear trousers. I don't know who made that decision. I don't know where it came from. And I was in GS1 and I was very small, like very, very small. Because I remember I used to look up to my classmates then. So, and in my class, I was still also like the giant, the person that, you, you know, would give the order what to do. And, but in a way, I was still into my stuff. So I'm more like an ambivert. In a, in a space, um, if you come into a space, you think I'm the one who doesn't talk at all, but when it's time to talk and do anything or get angry or order, make things happen, I'm there. And afterwards, I'm 
in my space and I had this innocent face. People would look at me like, this one doesn't mean anything. So, so then a lot of, um, I remember we did a lot of Aluta. Anyway, this was like the, one of the first. So they started giving the GSS three people trousers to wear. And then the following day, I didn't even ask any question. I didn't, my mom was a tailor and I had learned to sew from like really, really small. I had learned to sew. My mom used to have materials. And then I think, yes, then my mom used to sew for the school too. So I made my own trouser. And then the following day, I wore my trouser to school. <laughs> and then when I got to school, everybody, you know, my classmates, ah, this is how it's happening, you know. I just said nothing, you know, blank. And because I felt like they they, sh- they, 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 need, they need, should have explained to us why these GSS3 students would start wearing tr- trousers. And that was it. And I was in class. My teacher saw it. I mean, actually from assembly, some teachers saw it, but then they used to be like, ah, I'm a madam. So that's like Madame Pekin. So, ah, let's not beat him or let's not call him out or maybe, you know, we don't know. And then so on the assembly ground, I saw people staring, nobody said anything. And then I went to class and then there's this very teacher I hated so much, Mr. Olabi. And he shot, called me out, where did I get it from, told me to pull it. I said I wasn't going to pull it. You know, he sent me out of the class. I went to my um, aunt's office downstairs, the proprietress. So I shot, went into our office. I said, Mr. Olabi sent me out. I said, what did you do? I said, I did nothing, you know. And then went to the class. So they, I, I just started raising it like, this looks good on me. So if they felt there was no, ex- they didn't have to explain to other students why these other people are wearing trousers, then I don't have to explain. I don't know where that got came from. And my aunt would just laugh like, so they explained to the other teachers, okay, that I would stop. She kept telling me, I, I, I kept, you know, insisting every day I was wearing it. Other students were grumbling. And then I started to advise my friends too to find a way or to tell their parents to. And then that was it. And then it caused a lot of issues in school, but somehow that was how all of us from GS1 to GS3, we started wearing trouser. And then um, there was still, I mean, I would confront teachers, even though I was in GS1 up until my, up until I left the school, I would always confront the teachers, ask questions um, and I was just really bold. So there was, I. I know I caused a lot of issues um, in school then. Um, yeah, there was um, there was also a teacher that was harassing a girl then that um, we set him up. And, uh, from from what you've said, you you've been an activist. I'm sure you're still an activist. But you, um, whatever you did, wasn't like a negative. Um, a negative thing. I mean, you wanted to find out what did just what what differentiated you from the others who wore trousers, and through your activism, you can tell everybody by the time you left school, were now wearing trousers. So there was a solution, and it was a good solution from um, your activism. I'm sure you're still like that now, somewhat asking questions wanting to know what's going on, fighting for the rights of the people. Um, I happened to watch your sniper. It was fantastic, by the way. Um, We'll get to that at some point. So I have an idea about where your creativity started from. Your creativity started from your childhood, uh, being the grandson of possibly an Ifa priest, um, a, a diviner, seeing all those activities being put together. So you now leave school and you go into your undergraduate uh, studies. What university did you go to? Um, What inspired you to go into that university? And um, tell us a bit about your your, um, education in theater arts. I think that's what you studied, if I'm correct. Tell us um, what school it was and how it impressed on your life. Okay, um, I graduated from Unilag, University of Lagos, and studied theatre arts. But before Unilag, I was in UI, University of Ibadan. And I was in UI from 2007 till 2008. I left in 2008. Um, I was running my diploma then. The intention was to, then the diploma in UI was two years. Then from after two years diploma, you get into second year, year two, and then you have three more years. 
in the system. And then all of a sudden, after the first year, they added one extra year. So they made the diploma course three years, and then you still have to go into year two, not year three. So I thought it was a waste of time. And um, so I left after my first year, after my first year exam. And then, but while I was there, I was still trying to get into, I mean, my options were, I really wanted to be in UI or OAU because I knew, I always knew I wanted to study theater. And something just told me or something I felt, okay, yes, then I had started making acting in Yoruba movies and all of that. So I had met some of the Peter Fato Milola, some of, um, some of um, Uncle, um, the late, uh, uh, what's his name again? It will come um, to you. Lide, just... Uncle, uh, Uncle Lide, you know, um, they were lecturers in OAU then. I used to admire them in Yoruba movies. And so I felt I would learn good theater in UI or OAU. So I couldn't get into OAU. I had to leave UI. I tried Lasso. I was in Lasso from 2008. And after my first year exam also, I didn't have literature. All this while I didn't have literature. I kept writing Waek and again and again and again and again. And literature just didn't come. So after still in Lasso, after I think the second year in 2010, um, I met with uh, HOD Shalafo Sudo. Um, so then I had another result, Waek. Um, and then he told me Lasso should stop taking two O level results to merge. You would need only one. So which means I needed to write another one. And I thought it was really impossible. So I left Lasso second year. But God willing, that same year, the year I gave up on school, um, Unilag called me, even with my double results. And that never happened in the history of Unilag. I mean, they don't take two sittings as well. So I tried Unilag, got into Unilag in 2010, graduated in 2014. Unilag is a great alma mater. Um, I can understand why you wanted to go to OAU. OAU have a beautiful amphitheater where mm. they do a lot of plays. Um, all the schools you've mentioned, I, I partied in them. You know, uh, I, I, I lived in Lasso for, uh, yeah, one whole semester. I lived wow. in Lasso. Lasso is off campus mainly, you know, but um, in my activism, my youth, I went there from my school and stayed there for a bit. There was a time where um, I escaped from home <laughs> and disappeared for a bit. I was in Lasso. Same thing with Ife, same thing with Ibadan. Um, Unilag, Unilag <laughs> was my second home because um, I don't know if you know Ozalwa Road. Most of the professors there, some of their children went to school with me and I used to spend a lot of time in Unilag. We used to play football. You know New Road? There was yeah. a big field just at the start of New Road when you come out of Ozalwa. That's where we used to play football when you're going into the staff quarters anyway. Yeah, so Unilag, brilliant school. A great alma mater to have graduated from. Uh, give us some of your experiences in the theatres. Tell us um, what you did. Um, did you partake in any plays? Did you write any plays? What was the course like? How did that mould you into who you are now? Um, Unilag... I, I I mean I I remember I I always remember my experience in Ilag and I mean I'm still very excited I'm still in really close contact with Unilag um, apart from aside from running my masters there um, from year one I had always participated in school activities that I wanted to participate in because um, I, I also had issues with some of my lecturers in school because many of them I had met um, before school. I had started practicing before Unilag at all. I had started practicing professionally um, before Unilag at all. And um, the company I used to work with then, the Unilag also used to be like the rehearsal ground. I was more like the only person in that group then that wasn't a student. So all of them were in Unilag at that time. So I'd met my lecturers. Some of them I had, um, I had started working with British Council then. Some of them I had met at workshops outside school. 
or facilitated workshops that they participated in. So um, it, it felt a little awkward to balance. For some of them, you know, okay, outside is our facilitator and then now we're in school, we're his teacher. So for some of them, some, I mean, without mentioning names, you know, one of them didn't like me for it at all. And um, he thought I was really proud and he, he caused a lot of issues. But I participated in a lot of productions, the usual, um, I, I hate being, 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 feeling used or being treated not, or I hate not people not treating people the right way. Or um, um, I just feel uncomfortable when things don't, um, people don't accord uh, people they, um, what they deserve. So um, some of that happened in Unilag as well. And maybe, for example, lecturers, you know, would want you to do this job for them, which is a normal thing that yeah, they want you to do this job for them. But we've lost you. Flashing okay. the job. I'm sorry, a call just came in now, so I had to. I'm right. um, so it, it was a lot of that. And then lecturers would be like, oh, I'll fail you if you don't do this for me. And then for me, I mean, I like to hear things like that, and I don't like to hear things like that because then I have to now make you find every means to fail me, and if you don't fail me, there's going to be a problem. So it was really like that, and but in terms of participation, um, I mean, my group, every everybody in my class, sometimes when we needed to work with people from year one, you needed to work with people in year three. Um, I, I would say maybe because of my experience before school, I had times, many times, a lot of everybody wants to be in Joshua Labi's group. Um, I'm not trying to sound very proud, but it was just the, just the thing, and we're always getting things done. We're always going out of. We will, we would go out of our way to not look like a university production. We would make it happen like it's a professional production. Sometimes lecturers are really proud of it, and and so while I was in school, I started my company, and we kept performing, performing, doing a lot of things, and at some point we became. You know, without being asked, the Unilag Theatre Company and um, professors from engineering will call. Oh, okay, we want to do this. Okay, Joshua, you know, um, the VC they want to, you know, we want to do this, or the minister is coming, or something. We need a dance performance, we need a drama performance, we need poetry, and that was how we grew. That was how I grew um, as a student and also as a professional in school. And I wrote plays, yes, I wrote a lot of plays. I think um, I created more, the larger part of my, um, more works of my own. I created them while give, I was in school. Give us some examples of you, 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 some, you, before you got into Unilag, you were already acting. Give us yes. some examples of those movies so we can find them in the archives to add to your profile, you know? Tell us about the influences, the people who you acted with that influenced you, you know? You already mentioned one already, but please, let's hear about that part of it before we go into your um, your company that you now developed. Let's hear about that part of it first. Okay. Um, so some of the works, while I was making, while I was, while I was acting in, Yoruba movies. I remember I acted in Ile Babami, like my father's house. Um, I, I acted in Talele. Talele is like, who's this? Um, I think Femi Bright produced and directed it. Um, I'm not sure it's still in the industry. Um, I acted in uh, um, I'm trying to remember this title with Odun Lade, Adekola, and Regina Lakule. Regina used to produce um, for AIT. At, she used to work at AIT. Um, Odun Lade is a very uh, popular Yoruba yeah. actor. Yes, okay. this was in 2008. Um, 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 Rachel Oliga was my mom. Jide Kosoko was my dad. Regina Lakule was my sister. With one other girl, that was the first time. Um, I, I can't remember. I know the don't title. Don't worry, but it will it will come back to you. Don't worry. Yeah. Maybe by the time we finish, it will come back to you. So you yeah. you were already in these movies, 
then you got into Unilag. So like you said, some of the lecturers already knew you. Um, and as you gradually built up to get into your company, you were already doing things for the school itself, which is a thing of pride. Well done there, you know, for the VC to call you to do stuff for any visiting dignitary. You can tell that your work is very good. Um, so there you are, you've graduated. Um, you've set up your own business now. Um, please tell us a bit about your business, what it's called, some works you've done. I know you've done part uh, things to do with um, more and me. I think that more and me. Yes, the music. It, yes, it's a very... Uh, I remember when we were in secondary school, they used to act about more and me. I went to a Yoruba secondary school. I went to school in Idoani, Federal Government College. So during uh, social gatherings, they'd act things about more and me. There was even a very beautiful song, if I remember, about more and me. I, I can't quite sing it now. But tell us a bit I, about... I really know that song. Yeah, you know, tell us a bit about it, you know? Okay. Um, I, I'm sorry because uh, I have to like um, chipping something since yes. we're taking some so I was in I, I, I didn't mention this um, I was in Crown Troop so the company I said I was working before it's called yes. Crown Troop of Africa I was working under Shegwandi Fila so I worked with Shegwandi Fila in Crown Troop as a trainee from 2003-2004 there about um, until 2013 when I left um, but I had started my own company in 2011 while I was in Crown Troop um, so everything, almost everything I learned. The reason I stopped acting in Yoruba films, I actually stopped to join Crown Troop. Um, and the times, even while I was in Crown Troop, I acted in a few films with, like the Odun Lady one, for example, and some with Jimmy Odumosu um, and Tuneke Lani. It was because I felt they were doing really fantastic films that would move me forward. So I stopped those uh, Yoruba movies because I thought there was a lot of um, media pretty going on and we had some little issues so i was in crown troop i learned a lot from shagone fila like shagone fila like i would say molded me carved me discovered me um so um i always say that everywhere i go i appreciate him i i, I worked with um a lot with wale Ogun as well uh, along the line so they, they were like two strong people that i learned um from and i was living with shagone so i learned through i learned everything and grew to become his assistant director. So um, I'm sorry, I just had to. Um, talk no, no, about that's that's that, that's part of what we need. You know, okay. we we it it came in your recollection. Fantastic. Obviously, when we edit, maybe we'll move it forward or we'll move it backwards. But don't worry about it. If anything you remember that you think is interesting, you want to add, please feel free. Um, what's the name of your company? How did it start? Kenin saw concept. How did it start? What gave you that idea and that name? You know, let us tell us your, the history of your company. Um, I'm sorry, Mr. David. So um, I actually had to run to the office to have peace because if I had gone home, I wouldn't have peace. But there's someone who's been calling me and disrupting this. Take video. your call. I'll pause it. Don't worry. I'll, it's not I'll a problem. Yes. yes. Feel free. Feel free, my friend. Yes. Yeah. So we're recording again. Um, where did we stop? So we stopped at the creation of your company. Oh, okay. Please. Okay. Yes, so when I was in Unilag, in my class, we had 150 people in the class. Creative Arts um, was, um, had units. Um, there's, create, uh, there's theater arts department, visual arts department, and music department. So my class were like the largest. And I realized that at some point when we were working, I realized I was like the only one, or maybe there was one other person. Okay, yes, there was one other lady, Chumokia, who had written jam, filled in theater arts to come to Unilag to study theater. Every other person, they, they threw them, they dumped them into theater departments, creative arts, because they didn't meet their cutoff to either go to law, philosophy, and all of that. So while we're in school, 
it reflected in while we're working we're always you know um it, it reflected in everything they did some of them would even say it out loud like ah after this theater i'm coming back to an historic mass combo or i'm going to go abroad and go and do one course in something something or so a lot of them still wanted to come back to either study their law or philosophy or mass com or any other thing and that got me thinking like okay so um what then would be the fate of and you know generally there's the employment so so while while that was going on i started to think of okay why not and people are saying this because there's no industry to accommodate those who study theater there are no institutions um so i st- so i started to think you know there's the general unemployment or hala in nigeria or in every country you know but if you look at someone who studied accounting or banking and finance for example even though there's still no you know no jobs but there's still a firm that would employ them or a company that needs an accountant or a bank or you know they had the opportunity to work anywhere you study law you could you know you either work in a corporate company or you're working in a, you know some still have opportunities you even study mascom for example there's one tv or radio station that would like you know because you have many of them around the country but for those who study theater where will they go to and um the national well we have no national theater anyway so we only have a church in a national theater so what then would be the fate of all of us or people like me who want to do everything make it through theater so i said okay just maybe that's god telling you to start a company and create an industry where there's no industry and that was how kinisor started kinisor means what is he saying and kinisor just came out of me just thinking okay what name would my mom like because i was really close to my mom she taught me yoruba and i like know and understand yoruba very well and i'm a proud i'm really proud of that language and that culture so i was just thinking in my head so i had different names which one would be sweet in my mouth or and which one would um if my mom would were to pronounce it which one would she love the most so and that was how we started the company say okay we want to create that company that in the future would be able to employ would be able to employ 90% theater students who would while doing theater be able to do every other thing they would want to do stand shoulder to shoulder with those from other sec- from other industries and put food on the table at the same time so that was how kinsons started in 2011 i bet it wasn't easy um tell us about the early years the rough the tumble and then when you started to see movement success coming Tell us about that. You know, where did you set up? Uh, <laughs> you where were you based? In a one room? In you know, those kind of things would be interesting to know. Yes. Um. And somehow I think about it too, and I be like, ah. Some I just tell myself like, ah, I never suffer. But actually, you know, thinking about it, you know, we suffer. But it was just interesting for me. Or do I say fortunate? that we started in a in a we started in Unilag so we had Unilag as our base i remember our first letter had a paper then when we write we put the creative art we had our own logo on the left and then we had creative art logo and address on the big right you know where because we had offered value to the school so we could say okay yes this is our office and all of that and um it was really rough but at the same time I don't know somehow there's something in me that feels like maybe it's that part of me that doesn't feel like some nothing is too hard but um we when we started I just invited we used to have practicals in class normal practicals and then because everybody wanted to be in Joshua Labi's group for one practical or the other or any work group work so like that you would perform for the VC or perform around and i re- realized that i started having the same set of people some would walk their way into my group some would come and bribe me with money just to be in my group and some it would just happen so i realized i started having the same set of people in my school work in my school activities so and i think the first one was someone 
someone invited someone came to me then to say ah my my aunt or something wanted to get married please can you guys come and perform we had we did one um benin dance as a baby dance as one of our practical and i got the costumes i made everything it was really beautiful all women i played drums with my other colleagues and it was really nice and the person said oh would you perform that my aunt's wedding i was like of course why not just pay us to fair you don't need to pay us any money because i knew people would love it and so we shall went and we performed and that was like the first so i told them that okay guys we are going to this wedding as kinesa and this is what i'm working on and but because they are my friends too and you know how theater is we're always discussing i had friends in the don't be frozen please you're giving us a really good story uh, just for you there maybe my internet i'm going to go up go on. i can hear you now Okay. So I had friends within this group of classmates and I sold the vision to them. Immediately they bought it. And also because many of them were still finding they were searching for their own reason to love theater. They were find, trying to find themselves. I was trying to find myself too, but I was like the one man the man with one eyes who could see in the midst of Sorry, I'll I'll probably just switch to my Airtel. I don't know why Spectra is. Okay. I'm switching. There we go. And when teachers, some teachers who really um, appreciated my acting because I was, I mean, acting is still my first thing. I I know I act a lot. Like that's one talent that. comes freely so sometimes lecturers talking in class use my play or a play i acted in in crown troop or any other players uh just to illustrate what they were saying or so the at- attention started coming towards me and a lot of people wanted to students even within my sets my seniors wanted to come close other people from other faculties so that was how i realized okay these people are coming they all want to come close to me or they all want to associate with me what can we make from this or what can i make out of this and i started to sell the vision to them okay this is what i'm trying to do this is what i'm trying to do this is what i'm trying to do i'm hoping to have i didn't sell the big picture to them but i i sold what they were willing to buy at that moment i felt maybe if i told them the picture it would big picture would scare some away and that was how we started from that first wedding started perform performing for every almost every professor in unilag um every church inside the school and every lecturer and from other departments had someone who needed to do something and i would even go ahead to ask them to say sometimes i see posters around school or within school maybe a seminar um any event within school i just find a way get a phone number research know whose event it is um some would even be like oh no it's a strictly something event it's um, a seminar no no nothing like a performance and all of that and i would always sell to them like like okay this is the topic you're, you're talking on climate change so we can create something on climate change in a dramatic form that would look like this and and sell it to them and then they would be like oh, okay sounds nice we don't have money we don't want money so and then so let's do it and that was how we started doing it and then when we started making money 500 300 and um so that was the beginning of that um company and those who started with us Tosia DME Jennifer Gabata Roda a lot of them are doing really big beautiful things now and um we we funded it by ourselves and we had moments we tired moments something just kept it going and that was that was that was the beginning of um, I'm, i'm interested in um queen morami the musical um it, you know i told you when i was in secondary school we used to watch all those Yoruba plays and that you know now queen moremi is a great woman in yoruba folklore um tell me what it took to direct it did you partake in it or was it just you directing and um 
what was the reason you went into that? I can see something about the uh, great irony of Ife. You know, please give us a, a, a bit about Queen Moremi relating to the the um, irony of Ife. Um, so the the Queen Moremi musical, the initiative, um, the irony of Ife actually owns it. He it's even trademarked actually. It's something he's passionate about, and the, the project didn't start with me or with Kenin Soya. It had started in 2017, 18, thereabout, um, where they wanted to create. So the, the, the Queen Moremi, um, it's the Queen Moremi initiative. There's the fashion show. Um, it's just the they only created it under the House of Odudua Foundation as a project that would support women. Um, give them a voice in whatever industry they belong to. So there were different initiatives, different projects um, happening within the Queen Moremi. Um, there was a contest and there was really a lot. So the play is like one portion, of course, the biggest portion bit of the entire initiative. And when, when I heard about it that year, I did everything to join that project and it didn't work because those who were working on it were not people who would maybe want to work with me. So I couldn't get on that project. I did everything, and that's one thing about me. One thing, if I see this thing, I do everything. I, I, I get there. So everything positive. So I couldn't get on it. Um, and then in 2018, again, it was going to be produced. And um, I was still also reached out to a friend, Dotton Taylor, whom, who you, who you, I mean, who's a filmmaker, but at that time, it was um, one of the ambassadors of the House of Odudua Foundation working directly with the Oni Obife. So I reached out to him to say, oh, I heard this thing's happening and you're across the Oni. And then there's also Antia Shabi, who's um, around Tia Shabi, who was like working with the Oni as well. I reached out to them, they were like, ah, the person that the Oni has given it to, you know, um, it's being handled by a lady. And, you know, anyway, I, still that was futile. I couldn't join. And in 2019 um we heard the production what was going to happen again but this time it wouldn't happen with the previous producers and they needed a new producer so when i heard i called that my friend again dr taylor to say oh he's been in the us before then okay i heard this project would happen um please again i would like to be on this project i said okay no problem i'll send you someone's number she told me to call the other lady, Ashabi. Um, I called her to, so they sent me um, the princess, the lady who was like the producer, who was managing it for the Oni. Sent me her number, I introduced myself. She was struggling, I fixed the meeting, told her how beautiful my office uh, space looks like and she would like to see it. She would be blown away, she comes. And then she came and we had a meeting here and immediately um, we, we agreed to that. Uh, okay, I would direct the show for them and then also co-produce. Um, Kinesol would co-produce the show. So we more like managed the production, directed it from beginning up until the end. And um, so I rewrote the script. I did the dramaturgy. I mean, like, I basically like rewrote the script um, based on my knowledge of the venue and the font restrictions with um, with fond and so I wrote my, my version, directed it, and um, those who saw it were very impressed. Impressed. You 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 have um, you have international experience as well. Um, I can see stuff about uh, Dusseldorf, Germany, um, stuff for play projects for the UK AID, the DFID regarding um, the, I can even see stuff for the European Union and the British Council in Lagos um, tell us how you got into that what your international movement was like what you've done in that sphere and um, how that is also helping you um, at present and then we will now move into Sniper. It's a fantastic stage. The stagecraft is wonderful. So let's let's find out about your international experience a bit first, please. Okay. Um, I won't. I won't lie to you. I, so many times when I 
when I'm being asked this question. It's a bit, I don't know, it's not memory loss, but I don't know how it started. But I always try to share knit it somehow. Um, in 2010, I had the opportunity to go to Egypt, to perform in Egypt with, when I was in Crown Troop under Shogun Ekela. So the national troop then used to travel to different parts of the world to perform. So the national troop this time wanted to take a play to the Cairo International Festival of Theatre in Egypt and they approached Shagun Ekela. We had a play, a ready-made play written by Noel Craig, Whispers in the Dark. We had done it in Crown Troop many years, you know, many times, you know, those plays that you've done so much and you can just recite all the lines mm. even while sleeping. So they reached out to us, like, okay, let's play it. So, um, so it was a collaboration between the National Troop and Crown Troop. And then I went to Egypt, first time experience outside the country to perform, saw theatres. And while I was there, I said, everything I brought, I will bring it home. So, um, and 2010, we performed really fantastic show, saw other shows. And um, we came back to Nigeria, nothing again, until two years time, 2012. Um, I heard about the audition of The Whispers, um, no, of um, uh, Winter's Tale, Shakespeare's Winter's Tale, to happen in London at the um, Glo Globe to Globe World Shakespeare Festival. So Wale Oguntokun had been, was the only um, director invited from Nigeria. So I attended the audition, a lot of people. Uncle Bayo Dineye was on the panel and Wale um, Oguntokun and one other person. I was there, I think my performance was even Ogunde's, um, Ogunde's music, Mobojuwai, um, Yoruba Runu, which I also did in Crown Troop. And it was, Uncle Bayo Dineye was really blown away. Wale Oguntokun was impressed, he had seen me before. And I got a call back for the show, 12 people, I think, yeah, just 12 people to go to London. And we rehearsed with Kenny in the bag and Kali with um, um, Wale Adebayo, the Shango man. And so that was another opportunity to go to the UK and things became brighter and better and saw several shows in different languages. But I started making contact as I did in Egypt, made contacts in the UK as well. Um, and then came back to Nigeria, still, I still tried pushing. So what I would do was after coming, everyone started sending emails, finding ways to call. And I will never, no one would just respond to me. You know, you always feel, it felt like, I thought it's, it's like, you know, so no, no one reached out of all those people. But I kept, I kept going online, Google festivals, theater festivals in the world, um, dance festivals in the world, um, open calls for theater shows. Um, international residencies. I was just Googling, 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 kept Googling every form I would feel, every application, every, you know, and you know as it is, one would lead you to one, another one would lead you to another one, and then another one would lead you to another one. And so sometimes when I'm checking Google, I would maybe hear about a festival that had been discussed in Egypt or had been discussed when I was in London from people. So I, I kept researching and then some festivals would be like, oh, we don't, our next edition is in two years time. You know, and then I'll keep emailing them, emailing, 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 emailing until that two years time edition. And so I just kept trying, you know, on my system, the previous one and this, I know I have at least, sometimes when I'm searching for some forms, I, I, I have over a thousand, you know, open calls that I had filled or some of my colleagues had filled because we needed to travel to, we needed to perform our brother. So that was um, how we kept pushing, pushing 2014 again. So. Um, Wale Ogunjoku had to perform Tazam monologues in Edinburgh, but because I had the Egypt experience, I had the UK experience, I didn't run away. I came back to Nigeria, so um, he included me and we were in Edinburgh for like the month plus, performing every day. So Edinburgh is like the biggest theatre festival gathering in the world. So we were there for so long, so I could push more, I could I had almost, I mean, not every flyer, but I had hundreds of flyers and contacts and cards from Edinburgh that I still have them from 2014 till now. And from there, met the Soweto Gospel Choir. I made sure the relationship stayed and met a lot of people, took pictures. So what I started doing after that time was when I want to email people, I send them the picture we took together and then I send them, say, do you still use this phone number? You know, so when they see it, so people started responding, saying, hey, hi. And I mean, still nothing happened, but you know, me, with me pushing in that direction and then still searching and searching and searching online, I can't remember the first one. I can't remember how it started. 
I think maybe it was 2015, maybe one residency in, I'm not even sure. I, I just got an email to say someone from my company um, had been invited for a residency in Germany, um, my colleague, Annie, Annie, and they were not going to pay for visa, they were not going to pay for the flight, they were just going to pay for the accommodation there, his accommodation in Germany, and, and food, I think, maybe for a few days. But as long as we got an invitation, so I made sure I did everything, sold everything I could sell um, to make sure that my, um, he attended. So he attended in Frankfurt in 2015. And um, we managed to get the visa. Um, oh, you know, um, fortunately, we, my Crown Troop, the company I was, had done a lot of projects with the Gauthier Institute. And um, I was like the face of Crown Troop. Every big show, every major show, um, every show of, you know, we get a call today, it's tomorrow morning. I was always the one, I was the assistant director. So I was always carrying all the load, doing almost all the stuff. So my face somehow stuck. And I just walked into the Gauthier Institute that day to meet with the director to say, okay, um, I work with this, um, run this company and one of my colleagues was invited for this festival and this is and they will not pay for flight or visa this is what we've been able to raise so we told him we we raised about maybe 70k or something and i was really the really, director then makandro was really impressed so he gave us um the balance for the flights we booked the flight he gave us some uh, recommendation letter he got the visa my colleague went to germany for the festival but while he was there i'm sure he also did how as i would always do and they were maybe very impressed with his um presence the following year the same festival did that open call um for that residency and this residency had been changed into a two years uh, no a one year residency of um i think four months within that same year to go back and forth and they did an open call but they still then sent me an email to my with my name and all of that and then asked me to apply so i was quite happy i don't know them where are they from and then i remember that oh okay i think it's the same festival my colleague went for last year and then they selected me to be on the residency we had about 10 ladies um i was the only person from africa the only person from nigeria and while i was in germany kept going back and forth i went into every theater i could go into in in frankfurt I met every person, asked them to please recommend someone um, to me in other cities within Germany. I kept, um, sometimes I, I can be stylishly pushy and, you know, and he, he worked somehow. And when I began to explain and show some of the things we had done, they were really impressed. And from there, we started having invitations without having to apply recommendations and emails and phone calls started coming in. And at that point, because we had, we had also done a lot we had created a lot of works from unilag and then outside unilag but done a lot of shows so applying for grants or applying for so we started applying for grants say, okay let's try okay there's this grant and of course we applied for a lot we didn't get but i think from there things started to move grants started to come in small small um festivals then would ask us to say oh so what are you people doing um okay, we have a festival next year. Let's see maybe what you're doing or some of the things you're doing with the for the festival. And they started invited, inviting me to teach also in Germany and other parts of Africa, South Africa and Gola. So we began to do a lot of things with festivals and theaters within Africa and um, some parts of Europe. So this is basically your hard work. Uh, I'm a very strong believer in fate. Um, what will be, will be from our conversation so far i've observed two things your tenacity your hard work and your stubbornness <laughs> these are three ingredients that make a man right um there you are googling and googling and googling and googling asking and asking and asking building a portfolio and that is what leads to success, hard work, sometimes forgetting um, forgetting other things and concentrating on what 
it is that you desire. You'd already recognized from an early age that you wanted to be in the theater. And there's something you said that really impressed me. You said when you went to Egypt, it exposed you to some things and you said, I must bring everything international home. This is what the new Nigerian is about. Exporting the good things of uh, diaspora, combining it with the good things in Nigeria and trying to develop the country, not only develop the country, but with particular attention to the youth. You are in your thirties now. Um, I'm sure somewhere in Lagos, I'm sure somewhere in Ibadan, I'm sure somewhere in Joss, there's a young lad starting out and aspiring just as you aspired. So we look to see if we can bridge this gap to give that kind of person a chance. Um, we'll talk more about that privately. Let's go to Sniper. Sniper is about the suicide, uh, is about suicide. Um, until I watched Sniper a couple of days ago, I did realize that the suicide rate in Nigeria was quite high. Um, I didn't realize the abuse people get that leads them to drink Sniper. My word. What gave you the inspiration to do Sniper? Um, what social factors influenced that decision? And um, tell us about Sniper in short. Sniper, Sniper is a <laughs> Sniper is a story of, as you you've seen it, of love, yes. of love, family, friendship, mental health, suicide. Um, so the sniper didn't just happen, of course, just like every other work that King's Hall would make, they don't just happen. Um, I, I like process more than, I enjoy the process more than the product. I, it's out of curiosity from when I was young. I always want to know the why of everything and of course the how. And so Killing Saw, we had always talked, our, our plays, our shows, I'd always talked about something, I mean, very entertaining, humorous sometimes, um, plays, um, very deep, daring, but as entertaining as it would be, as fantastic, as stylized or technical as it would be, we just always want to say something small because that's why we're Killing Saw. What are you saying? So we want to say a lot of things. So we've made shows on cancer, on malaria, on social justice, on impunity, on and the same why or the same um, um, inspiration or the same thing that provoked some of those provoked snipers as well. The rate of suicide, as you said, has increased massively. And, and just like Nigeria, nobody would say anything. We are a generation of those who complain, who do nothing. We tweet and talk for two weeks, two weeks maximum, and things move forward. We just forget and we go on and everything is fine. As long as it doesn't concern me or it didn't happen to me or it hasn't happened to my brother. So I didn't lost anyone to, I haven't lost anyone to suicide, but I started to think of, maybe I shouldn't wait till um, you know, we can all say God forbid, but my brother or my sister or my nephew, I, sh I shouldn't wait until I, do, you know, I do something. And somehow, um, challenges meet opportunities. And um, while we, we had thought about it for over a year, and I kept telling myself, and that's what we say here, our mantra: we don't do what others have done. And if we do what others have done, we do it in a way that they don't want to do what they have done again after we do what we want to do. So I started to think, okay, a lot of people have been telling stories on mental health. It's been overflogged, even especially filmmakers and NGOs. We do too many things on mental health. And before you say mental health, and it's, it's starting to feel like, ah, this mental health thing too, is it? So 
And just about that time, the Gote Institute, we just invited the director to see our new space in 2019 to say, okay, that's what we're doing. And he said, oh, okay, after seeing what we're, what we're working on then, join body, he was quite impressed and said, oh, Joshua, we're working on um, a conference called Art and Soul, and um, it's on mental health. And um, we don't know how to involve you, but maybe we'd like to involve you somehow, some. And um, the grace God has given me um, also is that um, I'm always ready. I'm always ready. So immediately she mentioned that I gave her the story and I gave her how relevant it would be for their project immediately. And she was impressed with like, oh, cool. I'm so happy. And please put that in an email. And that was how the whole journey with Sniper started. And um, last year started to research. Early last year started to research and read, read, read up. Met with psychiatrists, met with psychologists, met with therapists, sociologists, a lot of people. And I realized, so while the research started, I realized um, it was even more than what I had thought. Um, the rate had massively increased. And um, so, I mean, mental health is a very wide topic. I needed to streamline it into what's the, it's all important, but what's the most um, relevant now as it relates to me and my generation. Um, what story do I want to tell? My generation, they are killing themselves and they think it's fun. Some think it's fun. Some think it will trend. Some think that's the only way out to chicken out. Some think, um, so they all think differently. And we started hearing stories. We started, I started to research. So I think um, there was about two months, because um, even during the lockdown, we have a small lodge at the office here, so we stay here, artists come here, editors come here, they just stay, people want to use the library. So I was here with some of my colleagues and then we were working and researching and talking and discussing and asking questions. And it began to even affect us mentally because um, we read sad stories. So we, we had to take a break for about two or three months, nothing sniper, nothing mental health, nothing nothing because it was beginning to um play on our mind so um and we we and interestingly all the characters in sniper their stories they are real characters in a way i read about so many people who committed suicide at some point i thought oh, it was just young people but i started to see pastors who committed suicide older people in their 50s and 60s who committed suicide 18 17 15 25 so I wanted to bring stories together to not make young, older people feel like, ah, JB is just the young people, you know, um, we are okay. Actually, we are all not okay, you know. So I started to blend some stories. I read some stories online. I read when we met with some um, health workers, told us some, shared some stories with us. And then I decided to say, okay, I would maintain the, I would maintain certain um, certain things from these real life characters. So for like Precious, for example, I mean, Precious is my own creation, but there was a lady who committed suicide who, because her boyfriend jumped her and she had a salon. So that was every the only thing I picked from um, whatever led to their the suicide or why had your boyfriend left her. So I, st so I started to recreate my own story, recreate my own story, recreate my own characters. Um, the Eton character, real character, um, real story. I mean, Eton, so I merged two stories for Eton, the boy who poisoned himself on Twitter. I merged two stories, two key stories. Okay, one boy whose mother had taken to a Christian university because she, and I mean, who was in a Christian university, his mother withdrew him because she didn't want to be, him to become a pastor. And then another boy who couldn't get admission, who failed jam. And then some other added some other stories. And so that was how we created Sniper. And for the last, my most favorite, Gadola, I don't know how, I was just listening to one sad music. I learned to play on the piano in Germany and the story of Gadola just happened. But um, in all, I think um, Sniper, um, Kinis has made, we've made a lot of shows, Polio of Men, we adapted, I mean, I always look for something to challenge me every time. And before Sniper, I used to tell everyone at the office that even some of our contract actors, like, 
as a follower of men, I haven't done anything that would challenge me so much. Like I want to do something challenging that even me I will fear and you know everyone will be like, some I want to do something that won't work, and then that would end up working. You know, um, and and, and follower of men was really beautiful because follower of men we took three plays: a show in car play and a show in some play and a body show one day play. Three heavy plays. Caught them somehow, recreated characters, merged it, and then showing cast it and said, "Did I write that thing?" And then <laughs> and and Oshofi song as well felt, um, created our own title and felt like I've heard these lines before. They sound like oh, I've seen this character before. They, yes, sir, prof from your play. So we did this, and so it was really beautiful, and I felt uh, really challenged and excited. So when Sniper started, I, so I knew. Um, maybe this will be the next challenging thing. Until now, and um, even while we were rehearsing um, in the office, we started to tell ourselves, you know, excluding the actors, to say, you know, guys, after this show, we have to find a therapist for everyone, for the actors especially, because ah, he <laughs> did them as they were saying Lagos, he did them strong team. Mm. It was, mm. um, it, was really it was really tough. It was really tough. And for me to. I don't, nothing would make me cry. I'm so hard-hearted sometimes. And uh, over and over from rehearsal, everyone would get teary and we'll just stop rehearsal some days and not rehearse, everybody sleep or everybody go home, everybody, you know, and um, it's been very, it was very intense and I'm, um, I'm, I'm excited. But I think that's what um, a true work of art, um, I think that's what it should do. It should, it should keep- um, Stimulate. Yes. To the audience mesmerized like he kept me watching yes. a whole one hour 38 minutes of it without mm. pausing right so we've talked a lot about you we've talked a lot about your work i'm sure anybody who listens to this after we've edited mm. have will have a story what's next what's in the pipeline what's in the offing what are you looking forward to I have a few suggestions, uh, but let me hear from you first. What's next? Or is there something in the pipeline already? Is there a new show? Is there? Um, okay. Um, so there, there are new things and then there are ongoing things. Even though we were hoping that better things come happen because COVID like killed so many things. And um, so we're like trying to just first things, not giving up, let's just do something, make something happen. During the lockdown last year, we started something called the Home Theatre Series, where we started to pick some plays where some plays we had done over the years. We took, um, we, we recreated, we took Cal 25 excerpts from all the scripts. So we started making them into short films, short theatre films and just for social media and we shot during the lockdown during the heat of the covid um with no money i don't know how we survived it and we made them really well we made them really good um, um no one would believe we we didn't we had no funds and we just had to do something so we have videos several videos of home theater so while we kept releasing it per episode different stories we kept shooting more because we realized people were enjoying them and they told different stories and um, so that's still going on. We still have some series of from home theater that we're shooting, and home theater would probably be showing on um, Pop Central, some TV stations soon. Um, um, and we we have we also do trainings. Aside performing, we have a class. Everywhere is actually um, a workspace. So we are training. We had to stop because of COVID, definitely. So in July also. We're kicking off our, um, our um, training, our classes with um, KF Lab, and it's just a digital storytelling and business of creativity training, but it's only happening for 10 days. Um, and it's in collaboration with Watershed UK. Watershed is, is like a big, large creative hub in, the, in Bristol, quite funded, big staff, big facility. Um, and the training is about how artists from different creative um, units can um, begin to use, tell their stories in a more creative way 
um, and in a more digital appealing way because the world is changing and we all should like move um, to where the market is. Um, and the other side, the other bit of the training also is um, some of the things we have suffer suffered as an organization that we learned the hard way. We want creatives to begin to put them into perspective. Things like understanding contracting, business relationship, how to network, how to connect, how to create your own proposal, enough of using mouth to tell people that bros, give me money, let me make a film, or you know, um, how to understand systems, how to create systems. Even if you're working with a team of three only, let there be a system that would work, that the business will not crash even when you're not there. That how can you make money when you're not there? So we're teaching them all. So that's some leadership, entrepreneurship. So the training is um, all encompassing. Um, so we're kicking that off in July. And then in August, we go back to our director's training. In September, we have our produ producing and production training and up until December. And then also we are starting monthly plays in July as well. Weekend plays at our space here. It's a very small compound on the grass area. And we're starting monthly plays there every weekend. Um, and we are working on touring Sniper. Sniper is like the main um, project now. We don't want it to die because there's a lot of even till this night. There's a, the feedback. It's been, it's been, it's been really I, strong. I, 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 I kid you not. Sniper will make a big impact in the UK. I think wow. it's something you need to sell to the Brit uh, to the Bristol, uh, the Bristol people. It will make a big impact because the rate of suicide here as well is, wow. is unbelievable, you know. Wow. So in essence, you've created something really big, you know. Um, where do you store your material? You've got a lot in your portfolio. Um, are you storing them for sale? Are you looking for an outlet? Uh, the reason I'm asking is quite simple. Um, I think if you have time, please go on our website. It's the new Nigeria.com. Uh, we have a video section that we're just starting to build. Um, we initially started with uh, trying to get Nigerian artists, both in diaspora and in Nigeria, to drop their movies there you know, uh, to drop their musicals there. So we've got well, maybe 10 or 15 musicals from musicians based in Germany. There's mm -hmm. one based in Ireland called uh, J Yellow L. If, I don't know if you play FIFA, FIFA um, on PlayStation. He's, yes. he's got a track on FIFA 20, you oh, know. Nice. Yes, so he's got his album, any music he releases now, he puts there. Obviously, they, they, there's no money making yet, yeah. you know, but um, it's just the thought of sharing, you know. Um, we've got a podcast session section where this is going to go into. Um, we're thinking of movies as well. Um, we're thinking of plays, you know. So maybe this is a chance to collaborate, you know, which is basically what we do. It's a collaboration, find a niche together. Now I'm going to drop names. I don't know if you know these names. Um, Dagogo Dinimas, he's in Germany. He, in the early years of um, Nollywood, um, he was a top, uh, makeup artist, but now he produces films in Germany. Um, obviously, you must know Basaj Taria Jr. in um, Nigeria. Do good. Um, these are people I know. I have um, a film producer in Luxembourg. I have one in Canada, you know, and I'm thinking, this is a collaboration already. Why don't you all come together? and do something. I am sure that I can organize a sit down for you guys as artists, because I'm not an artist, you know, but I know that if you guys sit together, um, you guys can come up with something, which is a collaboration and which is uh, basically what we do, you know. Um, think about it, there's no rush. You've got yeah. a lot on your plate at the moment, you know. Um, 
hopefully I'm going to, once this is done, I'll send it to you to proof before we post so that you'll see the impact of your words, the impact of what you've done. It may be a new realization will come and who knows, you could even do something about yourself, put a play up about you as a person <laughs> because you're a success. You're a Nigerian success. And we would like everybody to know that you are a success, you know? So maybe in time you can do that in form of an autobiography or something, you know? Um, at this point, I would like Lucia to unmute and um, please say something to Joshua, you know? Uh, give a bit of inspiration or talk about Joshua before we round up. I'm sure you guys have things to do as well. Ah, Joshua, Josh, uh, <laughs> I don't even know what to say, like, I'm just blown away, you know, those days when I can see there's no coincidence that I get to go. Yeah, you're a bit quiet, Lucia. <laughs> For real? Can you hear yes. me? Yes, now we can hear you, yes. Okay. I said, um, when I met Joshua, you know, there was just something about him that attracted me to to what he does. Um, what Kinesa does, I would say that I try to support, yeah, because I see there's an aura around you, Joshua, and I'm very, very privileged to say I know you. I want to thank you for what you have done with Kinin. So I know you, you, we know all the other guys, but you have stood out by creating that institution. Like you rightly said, I can see Angela doing greatly in the place you've put her. I've, I see what you do with your costume guys. I seen you've given you've given these guys roles and responsibilities. They have actually put them out there in the industry as professionals to be reckoned with. So for that, I thank you. For touching on serious topics like this, I thank you. Um, David, I didn't mention this to you, but uh, I've already mentioned to Joshua how on two times I tried to take my life. And, you know, watching that um, play made me realize the beauty of life. You know, he says something in that place, say, um, choose life, right? That's it. Choose life. So now the way I'm going about my life now, people will never understand. Check my post, you see that I'm I'm beginning to do things that have always been in my head. Right? Now I'm I'm actualizing every anything that comes into my mind, I'm like, man, choose life. Just do it. Choose life. And I thank you for that, Joshua. I really, 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 really wish we could take this to secondary schools because we're losing our younger ones to to rubbish. We can't begin to say all the things that are happening in our society now. We're losing our younger ones. It would be a great idea to take this to the secondary schools and to the universities, to communities. I know it's not it's not cheap, but that's one of the things that I pray that all of these collaborations that we're talking about will um, actualize and, and become. Uh, I just want to say thank you and for honoring the invitation to be on this podcast. I say thank you. Thank you so much. Brilliant. Brilliant. Thank you, Lucia. It's been a very um, educative and interesting evening. Um, Joshua, I've got to let you go now. I'm most grateful for your time. My regards to fiancé and um, the whole troop. Say hello to the office. And um, once this is done, we'll send it to you, okay? Lucia, thank you for bringing a gem. This is what we call a gem. Thank you for bringing it to us. And we'll see what we can do, okay? Thank you I'm so much. I'm most grateful. You. you guys have a good evening and uh, speak you again too. at some time. Oh, All right. Take, Take care, care, everybody. Josh. Bye Cheers. for now. David. Bye. <laughs> Bye.